Okay. So and I'm uh, sure we'll have some more people joining too, but yeah, welcome. Welcome everybody. Um, so today we have on the Perfect Foods class show, whatever you call this, um, we have a really amazing guest speaker, um, Garrett, who is going to be talking about mushrooms. And as many of you know, who are coming from the Perfect Foods community, um, it's a big passion of mine to not only talk about superfoods and mushrooms are a huge, huge, huge passion of mine, but also to support local entrepreneurs and business owners that are doing a good thing because that's us. And we definitely want to acknowledge and support other people who are doing that. So um, thank you everyone for being here, taking time from your evening and let's get right into it. Let's learn about mushrooms. Give me a comment and bo comment one below in the, in the comments. If you have like a love in your heart for mushrooms and give me a two, if like you see people who are obsessed with it and you want to learn more. <laughs> so are you obsessed or do you just like feel like you should be obsessed and you want to learn more either way you're in the right place. And um, Garrett, I'm going to have you be the spotlight. You are my man. Would you like me to make you a host so that you can um, share your screen? Uh, sure, that would be great. I've got the PowerPoint pulled up. So yeah. Cool. All right. So you are in business, and yeah, uh, and definitely. I, tell us a little bit about like um, yourself, how kind of how you got started, and um, and then Birch Boys in general. Absolutely. I certainly will. Thank you guys for the opportunity. I'm really happy to be here. So I'm looking for that host button or, oh, here it is, the screen share. All right. So before I do, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Garrett. I sell chaga and other wild fungi that are harvested here in the Adirondacks. Um, I learned about chaga from my grandmother when I was 15 years old. And that was sort of my introduction to mushrooms and healing mushrooms. And I'll show you, this is what a piece of chaga looks like. So this is how it grows on the tree. If my tree was, if my arm was the tree, it would stick out of the trunk like a big horn. Um, and I learned about it from my grandmother because one day- you know what after, is? What's that? No, no, no sorry. <laughs> Um, I learned about chaga from my grandmother uh, after I mowed her lawn one day just because I was thirsty and I went into her refrigerator and I found this jug of uh, iced tea and it looked kind of like kind of like this just iced tea in a pitcher and I drank it uh, just because I thought it was tea and I was thirsty and uh, she came into the kitchen and she saw me drinking it and her eyes lit up like she had just seen a ghost and she told me I was drinking a fungus. And so that was like my uh, surprise introduction to mushrooms. Um, and she actually had just been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Uh, so she had learned about chaga on a trip with the Tupper Lake Adult Center. And they just happened to go on this foraging trip. And she had just learned, or she had just been diagnosed with cancer. And she found this, this guide in Maine who taught her about chaga and he, taught it as if it was the cure-all to anything and he called it the king of herbs and so she's we're in her backyard because she had it growing on a tree in her backyard and she pulled me out to her backyard and she's just rattling off all of these health benefits about chaga saying it can fight cancer electrospell saying... chaga what's that bella it's spelled c-h-a-g-a yep. yep thanks c-h-a-g-a it's a russian word chaga um and some people call it chaga. Some people call it shaga. I call it chaga. Um, but uh, that was kind of my introduction to it. And then I started just seeing it everywhere in the woods. And I started harvesting a lot of it. And um, I'll get into that piece of it, too. I want to show you guys a little video of kind of what it looks like when we're out harvesting chaga. So I'm going to share my screen. Pull up the presentation. If, okay. if, you know, if you know how to um, mute everybody, because I made you the host, um, sure. if you know how it, to but, I mean, as we get toward the end, um, I don't know how, but as we get toward the end, you guys can ask questions too. It doesn't bother me to be interrupted. Totally. I just, you know, people go in and out of 
voices and I don't want anybody to interrupt. So if everyone could just mute themselves really quick, and if you have any questions, just put it in the chat. And then at the end, you can unmute yourself and ask questions. Cool. So as you can see here, chaga can get pretty big. Um, it grows right on birch trees. These are uh, different mushrooms that we were using uh, to extract in making tinctures. I just told my story, but that's my grandmother here who taught me about chaga. And actually I left this part out, but you can see there she's spinning wool. And uh, that's basically how I got into selling chaga. She used to go with all of her friends who were basically senior citizens, uh, part of that adult center group. And they would go and uh, sell knitted scarves and mittens at farmer's markets and different craft fairs. And so they snuck me in one day to sell chaga and we did really well. We sold like $300 worth of chaga and so I quit mowing lawns forever <laughs> to sell fungi. And that's kind of what it looks like. Oh, and then I went to Clarkson University when I was, uh, when I skipped my senior year of high school to go to Clarkson and I met this guy named Josh Parker. And Josh Parker had a maple syrup business. And um, we actually had to have this class where we had to team up and form groups with the other students. Uh, and make a business plan. And I teamed up with Josh because we were the two students who kind of had a business going into it. And we were planning to make this bottled maple chaga tea. And at the end of uh, that semester, the final exam was actually like uh, a real pitch session and they brought in investors and um, like you pitched for real money in the class. And we actually got offered a $7,000 loan uh, for the project. and. Um, then Josh uh, was very successful. He ended up going on Shark Tank. Uh, and so, um, and he got really busy with his business. And uh, it was kind of unfortunate for me because, uh, you know, we never took the the loan because he was so busy. And I realized that the best thing I could do was kind of not get in the way of his success. And um, then that summer, um, I had been contacted by this survival show called Alone on History Channel. And uh, they were looking for participants for their upcoming season. And I had always been into the outdoors and primitive skills. And I actually couldn't afford to pay for college that second semester. So this was kind of like my whole plan. I had uh, set up an internship to go on a loan. And then they called me like a week before boot camp, which just so happened to be about a week before my semester would start uh, as a sophomore. And uh, they kicked me from the project and I never learned why, but I was at like rock bottom at that point. I didn't have enough money to go back to school. And that's when I realized I wanted to make sure I succeeded and I pursued Chaga. And I actually went to uh, the business class um, advisor, like the Dean of the business school at Clarkson. And I asked her to let me go on an internship for my business selling Chaga. And by some grace of God, and she said yes. And so that semester when I was interning, I actually raised $65,000 at various competitions. Um, this one was significant, this retail and health innovation challenge at Wake Forest University, because that was like the first win uh, that semester that I was doing it. And um, I wanted to make my college proud, but also there were all these doctors. I mean, this was sponsored by CVS Health and I was competing against like doctorate level students at Wake Forest Univers University. And uh, it was very cool to see people like the vice president of Johnson & Johnson and all these other people acknowledge Chaga because they had known about it. And like they, they you know, they can't pursue it because it's not, patent it's not patentable. So there's never going to be a medicine from Chaga but to know that they were aware of it and its and its health benefits and had done studies on it, and some of them even were working on synthesizing compounds that are derived from chaga, you know, in a lab that may become future patented medications. So uh, I just thought that was really worth elaborating on. Um, now uh, we sell chaga tea. We sell it in chaga tea bags. Um, we do loose chaga tea. We do chaga tinctures. We do bulk chaga. Uh, we lease 220,000 acres of land to harvest chaga in the wild. And this is what what those land parcels look like. So um, it, we're, we actually lease one 
two hundredth of New York State. <laughs> so it's it's a lot of land, and uh, a lot of it's just vast primitive forest land. There's logging that occurs on the land. Uh, and this red X here is my location here in Tupper Lake. Um, we harvest in a unique area for chaga. I bring this up just because there is a little bit of controversy online about the sustainability of chaga harvesting and uh, in mushroom harvesting in general. And I want to just say two things on that. First of all, if you're harvesting a mushroom, any mushroom, recognize that a mushroom is a spore bearing fruit of a fungus. So it's kind of like the apple to an invisible tree. And just because you pick the apple doesn't mean, and just because you can't see the tree rather, it doesn't mean the tree isn't there. There's a mycelial network underground that lives on and on year after year. And by picking a mushroom, you're actually doing kind of what nature has intended for, because you're probably then traveling with it and helping facilitate the spread of spores. That's why I kind of like in campgrounds or areas frequented by people, there's often a wide variety of different mushrooms growing. Um, chaga is a little bit different because chaga is a sclerotia. It's not the spore bearing part of the fungus. It's really more of a, an immune supporting part of the fungus because the, the chaga is a parasite and it actually has to resist a living birch tree's immune system. So it's not just killing a dead tree or it's not just decomposing a dead tree, it's killing a living tree. And uh, the chaga is what it uses, the sclerotia, um, this thing, as a, a nutrient source of protective compounds that it keeps for itself and stores as it fights the birch tree, basically. And uh, this is a map of the golden birch distribution. We, um, we harvest from the yellow birch tree uh, primarily. Uh, we don't have, or they don't have yellow birch trees in Alaska or Russia or any of the major hotspots that chaga tends to grow. In the Adirondacks, we have both white, yellow, or white and yellow birch trees. And really all throughout Northern Appalachia, we have that. And so it lends itself to a much more robust chaga habitat. And there's a lot more abundant, large pieces of chaga. And I, I think I skipped the video. Here it is. Can somebody, once it starts, tell me if you can hear the audio? Um, no. Did you, did you, hang on, we're waiting. I'm waiting for it to play. You would hear it as music. Right. Okay, it's not playing. Oh, and it's, it's playing slow. Okay. Is it lagging at all? Um. I'm I'm just gonna skip the video. Uh, yeah. Hey, um before Who's you go with out. Yeah. Before yeah. before you even go further, um, can you tell us what chaga is and why you're so obsessed with it, what the benefits are? Just go right yeah. into that. <laughs> Definitely. Let me get out of this screen. Um oh. get back to my PowerPoint. So this thing is So chaga is um, a fungus. Let me exit the screen share. Chaga is a fungus that grows on birch trees. Um, people have been using chaga ever since the Conti tribe, uh, well, and probably longer than that. The furthest back we know is that the Conti tribe in Siberia was using chaga some 2,000 years ago to make tea. Um, Chaga is actually one of the richest sources of antioxidants among any naturally occurring food or substance that's ever been tested for antioxidants through ORAC score testing, as well as through DDPH. Um, it's rich in melanin. So like this outer black color and even the inner orangish yellow is like the full spectrum of melanin pigments and compounds, um, eumelanin and pheomelanin, um, which is protective in general. It's the same stuff that's in our skin, hair, uh, and, and eyes. So, I mean, in uniquely in Chaga, the melanin is in a soluble form, which is like actually very unique. So it can enter the bloodstream and melanin can chelate, um, different 
particles like metals that are toxic metals like mercury, uh, lead, things like that that get stuck in your body. Um, chaga melanin can essentially chelate it, which means it can, uh, in layman's terms, turn a solid into a liquid without having to reach its melting point temperature just through ionic bonding. And it can actually um, help you pass it through your system. So it can help you detox in a number of ways just because of the contents of the melanin. Um, it's also potent in triterpenes. Now, triterpenes are a class of compounds that are basically not water soluble. So you're not gonna get them out of a chaga tea. Um, they won't dissolve in water, but they do dissolve in alcohol. Um, and the triterpenes include betulin, betulinic acid, inotodiol, um, ergosterol peroxide. These are all different triterpenes in chaga. And almost all of them have pretty profound anti-cancer properties, antiviral properties. Uh, there's a lot of studies on the effects of the triterpenes in vitro or like in petri dishes um, on in cells. There's not really many human trials, but that the main reason for that is because there, no one is going to fund the research if you can't patent chaga in the first place. Um, so there are like some animal studies. There's some studies about, about chaga's anti-cancer properties on mice. Um, it really has a lot of properties that can be interpreted as generally beneficial for anything in any part of the body. Chaga does have um, a, certain things in it called oxalates. Does anyone know what oxalates are? Uh, if anyone does, feel free to just type it in the comments. But basically oxalates, if you have too many, um, they can leach calcium from the bones um, and they can they can basically form kidney stones. So um, I see someone does know what oxalates are. If you are prone to kidney stones, you would probably know what oxalates are. Um, chaga does have oxalates in it and it, that has kind of stirred up a, a little bit of concern on the internet. We actually did uh, an oxalate test on chaga and we compared it to some other things like spinach um, and other foods that we know are high in oxalates. And we confirmed that a cup of chaga tea brewed about this consistency is only gonna have 17 milligrams of soluble oxalates, whereas a half cup of spinach cooked would have 450 milligrams of soluble oxalates. So there's really not that many oxalates in chaga. There are a lot of insoluble oxalates and um, there's a woman who was eating chaga powder like by the spoonful and uh, she actually died and that's what caused all this stir. So chaga isn't edible in that sense because your body literally can't digest chaga. It's, it's very hard, uh, but it's a fungus that has been used virtually everywhere it grows for thousands of years for its medicinal properties. And it tastes really good. It tastes just like a mild, smooth black tea. So that's my introduction on what chaga is. Amazing. Are there any questions at this point? I have a few more, I have a few more questions for you. Um, those of you who uh, have questions, please, in, in one moment. But um, what is um, in the name of like foraging, right? So, um, I don't know if you're familiar with other mushrooms or with foraging generally. Oh, I just realized my video wasn't off. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with other um, like mushrooms for foraging or any wisdom on that, but I know right now is the best time of the year for mushroom foraging. So um, what would you recommend to somebody like me who lives in like, you know, Hudson Valley or in whatever, just in, in this area of the Northeast um, for foraging for mushrooms and just a few tips on that. I know there's like chicken of the woods, hen of the woods, just like basic one-on-one of a few like tips on foraging right now. Yeah. You know what, if you don't mind, I actually have a whole separate PowerPoint that's entirely on like the diversity of mushrooms that it's like an intro to mushroom harvesting. Um, if I could screen share, I see that that has been disabled again. Uh, I had, I'd love to get into that with pictures. Okay. And yeah. Totally. Okay. I'm going to, uh, I don't know what happened there, but hang on. I'll make you the host. Um, in the meantime, some of the questions were, um, how is it, can you have too much of it? Yeah. Anything in moderation, you know, you can have too much of pretty much anything. 
but with chaga i would say like if you order a birch boys product on on our website birchboys.com um just follow the suggested serving size um and, and you know you got to be careful because brands are going to they're going to recommend whatever they recommend but it takes effort to use too much chaga um i know that though during the pandemic there was a lot of hype about like chaga being very protective and so there were a couple of customers of mine that were like really doing a lot of chaga and one of them did get a kidney stone but that's only one that i've and i mean we've had a lot of customers at this point i've only seen that happen once ever and it was to someone who was drinking like probably like six potent cups like this per day or every day for like five weeks straight so um i say keep it to a maximum of one to three cups per day and if you're using the tincture you really don't have to can be concerned if you're following that suggested serving size and our blog goes a little bit more in depth on that. If you look up Chaga warnings, we're like the first, um, the first one that pops up. Oops, sorry, I was unmuted. Um, another question is: so, do you still do you distill it down to make it edible? Um, we just brew it. We literally just extract it with hot water, and then we drink Chaga tea. Um, you can extract it. Uh, but it's not edible in the sense that you eat the chaga. It actually gets discarded, the chaga itself. Um, so Garrett, tell me if I'm wrong, but you like those big pieces like you have, you break it up and kind of grind it yep. out this one way. That's exactly correct. Um, now in this PowerPoint, we'll get into mushrooms that you actually eat. Um, but yeah, we, we break it up and we grind it. And, and then, but then again, we're just extracting it. We're putting it in tea bags, we're brewing it in tinctures. We sell extracts more than the mushrooms themselves. Um, so this question I get a lot, mushroom or fungus. Uh, the difference between a mushroom or a fungus is just that a mushroom is the reproductive organ. It's the spore bearing fruit. So every mushroom belongs to a fungus, but not all fungi produce mushrooms. And that I'm going to skip over. I don't think that's really, those are our tinctures. Come on. And those, you harvest those yourself also in that same land region where you get the chaga, correct? Yes. Everything besides the lion's mane and the maitake. And it, if you'll excuse me, I guess I pulled up the wrong PowerPoint. <laughs> um, I have a great one. Yeah, this is the one. Okay. So when I look at a mushroom, I always try and determine, is it edible, toxic, psychoactive, or medicinal? Um, and I'm going to start by getting into like some edible mushrooms. Um, this is one determination you can make that helps. Uh, if you look at the underside of a mushroom, you want to check to see what sort of spore um, spore producing uh, matter it has. So there's things called, uh, these are called gills, traditional gills, like most mushrooms have. But this right here is kind of like porcini mushroom. Uh, this this is like spongy and it has pores or, or tubes. Um, so these spongy mushrooms have tubes that still have a cap and a stem. These all fall into a category um, or a genus, but it actually is a category that includes more than this genus. They're called boletes, uh, the genus boletus. So the most famous one would be like porcini mushroom. Uh, and here in the U.S., uh, we have the king, the king bolete, which is basically uh, the the Western variation of porcini. But there's the bay bolete, the pine bolete, the birch bolete. Any of these mushrooms that have like a a spongy bottom, it means it's far more likely that it's edible than not. It doesn't mean that every single mushroom with a spongy bottom is edible, but the vast majority are, and I'm not aware of any that are actually so like so poisonous that they'll kill you. There, there are some that cause gastrointestinal upset, but boletes are a really good, easy way to start getting into mushrooms. And just to let you know what I do whenever I'm harvesting mushrooms that I might consider eating, 
you have to take a picture, take a picture of where it's growing in the field. You know, you want to see, is it growing on a leaf litter? Is it growing in pine needles? That sort of thing makes a difference because it forms relationships with certain trees. Um, and if you document it from the start, it makes it a lot easier than trying to remember. So I always take a picture, of course, look at the underside. Um, we'll talk about a thing called spore prints later. These are common puffballs. Um, puffballs are a very common mushroom. You see them, I, at least I do, almost everywhere in the woods on rotting logs. And there's two types of them. Uh, there's a type like this that grows in clusters. And then there's this other type that grows kind of few and far between. You'll find one or two. Um, these ones that grow in clusters, if you break them open and they have a firm white center, they're edible. And some people like to scramble them uh, and salt and pepper them kind of like scrambled eggs. The ones that are inedible, I'm sorry, the ones that are inedible, the puffballs that you can't eat are going to have a black or dark center. So really, if it's clean white, it's good. This is lots of forest sulfurious, chicken of the woods. Um, I call them sulfur chickens. Uh, these are a really fun one to look for. And they grow on pine trees and hardwood trees like oak trees. Um, it's better to find them from an oak tree because sometimes the pine tree uh, born chicken of the woods will cause some gastrointestinal upset. That's only for sensitive people. I eat chicken of the woods all the time from pine trees. And uh, frankly, I don't find anything upsetting about it. I think it's very good and nutritious. Um, this is a mushroom that's very hard to mistake for another mushroom. So if you just take a good look at this here and see something that looks pretty much just like it, it's probably chicken of the woods. Okay, so I, um, you said, so you want to have it on evergreen, like pine, pine trees or not pine trees, not pine trees. Ideally, not a pine tree is what they say. Um, and I've eaten but it from a tree. I've, the I've had it from, I think then a pine tree because mm -hmm. one time I harvested chicken of the woods and maybe we got a little overzealous and we got very excited and we ate like a lot, like as you were showing, like a lot. And we started like, just a okay. little, like a little, <laughs> a little salivating from like, we were fine. We didn't throw up right. or anything. It was just a little bit of a, a, a mild upset. So exactly what you were talking about. Like it wasn't like it was poisonous by any means, but something was like a little bit off. And also we had a lot. So I'm like, that's where I'm like, I want to know what to do now. <laughs> well, I'm, that's good to hear it. I'm glad this, that's been a useful piece of information. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, there's a book I would strongly recommend if you want to get into mushrooms, just it's a really good book and I like the way it's organized. It's the National Audubon Society's Field Guide to North American Mushrooms. And, you know, I'll pull up a picture of it just so you guys can see um, because it really is a good book and it helped me. It's like it makes finding the mushrooms that you're seeing in the woods easy the way that the layout is. Oh, good. Also, there's like a bunch of Facebook groups and apps also where you can take, there's an app where you could take a picture of it and it'll yeah. kind of identify it, um, which is obviously not foolproof, but better than, than nothing. Um, but well, also, yeah, similarly I to, I'd be very careful because you're, like you said, it's, it's just worth cross-referencing that the apps. Yeah. Um, the chicken of the woods <laughs> versus hen of the woods are yeah. very slightly different, but like, yeah, I don't think you had a picture of the hen of the woods. Is the hen of the woods just like a little bit lighter? I would, I would say they're quite different, actually. They're entirely different genus and species, which is funny, you know, that they call them almost the same thing. It's very easy to mix up the name, but they refer to two entirely different mushrooms. And I'm glad you brought that up, but we will talk about maitake later. That So hen of the woods is maitake. Um, and that's what I, I mean, it's best to learn their genuses, even if you don't know the species. It's not that hard to kind of start learning the genuses of the mushrooms. So uh, maitake is Grifola frondosa, and that's a brown mushroom that grows at the base of oak trees. It's not going to grow on the tree like chicken of the woods would. Um, it will grow on the ground near it, and it's brown. It almost looks like a big pile of leaves, and in the fall is when it grows. It grows a little later in the season. So it's easy to like actually miss because it looks like a pile of the falling leaves um, at the base of the tree. That's interesting. I just saw um, a cluster of what looked like the chicken of the woods that you showed me, but it didn't have um, 
the pink on it. It was just white. Mm -hmm. Does could, like it looked like that, like with okay, but not oyster. No, it was it was thicker. It looked like the chicken of the woods, thicker and but it's just completely white. It was oh, it was completely white. Yeah. And it was it growing on the tree or on the tree? Base? On the tree. Hmm. It could have been. It could have been oysters. They oysters do have. There's different types, and they they grow a little yeah. bit. It kind of looks like the oyster, honestly. I didn't know that oyster was that easy to find, and oyster is edible. Yeah, I find I find a lot of oysters actually. Um, and so that book I was talking about is right here, uh, the National Audubon Society Field Guide to Mushrooms, and it's a it's a good it's a really good introduction. It's easy to keep on you, and it actually helps because it's not hard to find the mushrooms. Some of the books that are really in depth, it's like you have to look forever to even find what you're looking at but this will tell you as a visual reference on like how to find which mushroom you're looking for and I think that was very helpful for me amazing I remember when I was first getting into this I was using the Facebook group okay. but I remember posting in the Facebook group like a picture and someone was like that might be edible and then after that ever ever since that I was like never mind I'm not using these groups if people are going to respond with that might be edible then this is not worth it to me <laughs> uh, and people are jerks sometimes too. I mean, people will, people will just be jerks on those groups. And like, um, they'll they're like, if you don't post every angle and every picture, every clarity of the picture, you know, if you don't take a spore print, they'll say like, you're not doing enough. And so it's like, yeah. Right. Um, there's also a great website called mushroomexpert.com. Michael Kuo is the guy who, uh, who did the, the work on that, but mushroomexpert.com. If you're an internet person, that's what I would always do is take a picture of the mushrooms I found, go back to my computer and then do a bunch of research. And I always would find myself on mushroomexpert.com. He had almost everything. Uh, this is, <laughs> that's my dog, Joey. Um, and this is a morel mushroom. Morels are pretty hard to mistake uh, for another mushroom besides the false morel. There is like a brainier sort of, it's more like violet colored and a little bit less rough texture, more like more like gelatinous in a way there's this thing called the false morel oh. the false morel is not edible the false morel is not edible but it's not going to kill you if you eat it you know it's not it's one of those gastrointestinal upset mushrooms okay, okay so just want to get philosophical uh, for one second just for pure entertainment do you think that there's something funny going on with mushrooms where they're trying to like absolutely um, do you think they're trying to like fool us? Like they're playing a joke on us. Like, oh, I'm going to make this one, but it's going to be poisonous. It's going to look just like it though. <laughs> or this what one's going to be. Like the, I think the joke is that like, we've been so taught to be afraid of them. You know, that's what I think. Is I'm funny still about. afraid though. Yeah. We were taught from the time we were children, like don't ever touch a mushroom because you're not even close to being capable of ever being able to confirm whether or not it's safe. Like that's what I was taught. And to be honest, it's just not true. Like there's some simple things and characteristics to look for. Um, and, and honestly, you could say the same thing about plants. There are a few plants that will kill you. Um, and I, I personally find mushrooms easier to identify than plants. And there's a whole category of mushrooms that are to be avoided. And I'll just skip ahead to that. Actually, little brown mushrooms, F little brown mushrooms. There's nothing good that's gonna come out of picking and eating little brown mushrooms. Um, there's this genus no. and, uh, Gallerina is pretty, pretty deadly and it's kind of a shapeshifter. So, um, you want to be careful, just avoid little brown mushrooms. A lot of them are toxic. And ironically, that's like the same category that the, well, somewhere in here, the hallucinogenic mushrooms. If you go out looking for wild magic mushrooms to get high or to take a trip, you're just messing with very dangerous territory because they are little brown mushrooms. Um, and so that's when you'll really get into some trouble on some of those Facebook groups is if you're trying to confirm whether or not it's a psilocybin mushroom, uh, expect to be criticized. That even There's even an acronym, LBM, um, just avoid LBMs is what people will tell you on forums and things like that. Um, so anyway, this is coral. Now, there's all sorts of coral mushrooms, some of which are edible, some of which cause gastrointestinal upset. And I think there's something funny going on with that, the gastrointestinal upset thing, because like 
I think that there's just a lot of mushrooms where people have not figured out whether or not they are safe to eat or, or, or not. And, um, and I think a lot of mushrooms that have once ever reported or caused anyone any gastrointestinal upset kind of get lumped into that category and people are too afraid to really know. And I'm not saying that we should all be experimenters, right? Uh, not at all, but it definitely is like, there's categories of things in, that are deadly and things that are not like genus Amanita is a mushroom that's deadly. Um, and m many of the mushrooms in that genus are deadly and it has very characteristic properties and physical characteristics. This is lobster mushroom. This one grows out of the ground and it looks like a lobster tail. I normally find it in pine needles and, um, and you'll find that it, around it, the spores kind of like form this white powder on the ground and it tastes just like lobster. If you cut this up and cook it like lobster, it's remarkable how much it tastes like lobster. There's something weird going on with that for sure. <laughs> um, these are yellow foot chanterelles. Chanterelles, people go crazy over chanterelles. I don't really, I'm not like super into it. Like I haven't really went and harvested my heart out of chanterelles, but I found them in the woods. Uh, they kind of look like a trumpet in the sense that um, the, their shape and the gills kind of go down further on the stem rather than um, parallel or perpendicular, I mean, to the stem. And they're very yummy. People normally bake them. Uh, so I I really focus on the barky I, I mushrooms. Uh, $30, $41. Cents. Yeah, we got lost. I'm not lost, bro. I went to their house. I yeah, Sorry, if everybody can just mute themselves, <laughs> if you can mute anybody, I'm not a, I'm not the, um, yeah, yeah, I just stapled together, so I don't know. Yeah, I just stapled together, so you want to help me out here? I can't, because I'm not the host. Thank you very much. All right, stick there. Um, actually, I don't know. Well, so anyway, these are the mushrooms <laughs> I sell. Rishi, um, Ganoderma suge, and artist conch, this mushroom that some people call white rishi. Um, this is a mushroom you can draw on and it will actually uh, dry. Whatever marks you make on it will dry and stay present. So maybe you've seen the art of the artist conch somewhere. Uh, we sell lion's mane, Heresium arenaceus, and Heresium americanum. Um, this is a great mushroom. It's an edible mushroom and it's a medicinal mushroom. It has great properties for the brain. Um, oh, I meant to tell you Rishi's properties. Rishi is great for inflammation. It also helps with oxygen absorption in the bloodstream. Um, it can help reduce stress and help people sleep who have insomnia just because it's relaxing. Uh, lion's mane is great for your health or brain health, cognitive function, uh, regenerate, regeneration of nerve cells. Turkey tail is uh, actually in an FDA approved clinical trial being used as an adjuvant therapy. Turkey tail has polysaccharide crestin and polysaccharide peptide. So um, it's been researched for its anti-cancer properties due to that. Oh. Cordyceps, this is a really cool mushroom and it's the only one that is also a sclerotia like chaga. So cordyceps and chaga are just sort of in their own league when it comes to the power of the medicinal properties. I want to just be very clear though that like wild cordyceps is extremely rare to come across. Um, it actually hosts on the pupa of the Luna moth where I live, but depending on where you live, it hosts on a range of different insects, sometimes even toads and frogs. Um, so it forms a sclerotia to protect itself from the host. And uh, wild cordyceps is far more potent and powerful and healing than cultivated cordyceps. And the same is gonna apply, of course, to chaga because you're actually going through the stress of like having to live and defeat a living organism. Uh, and here's maitake, Griffola frondosa. It's uh, not the best picture of maitake. It's one of the few pictures I haven't taken myself here. Um, yeah, that's the other thing I wanna just say. I took all these pictures of every mushroom in here myself. Um, these are real photos. That's awesome. Uh, and so, yeah, that's that's basically what I have to share. There's some mushrooms I left out. And actually, the only other thing I want to share is a quick little story about Amanita muscaria. 
Must, the alternative must talk topic. about Amania, um, Amania Viscaria. <laughs> Let's see. Let me find my little PowerPoint on that. It's very helpful. Cool. Amazing. Uh, while he's looking for that, does anybody have any questions while we have a um, expert forager? They are yummy with shallots and vegan butter or butter. Okay, yeah, so different ways um, to use mushrooms, right? So like, for example, yeah, some type of, I remember when I uh, made mine, I used lemon juice and garlic and gar like garlic powder and like just, yeah, kind of like the fragrancy lighter things because the, the mushroom itself, especially for like chicken of the woods and oyster is just so meaty. It's so like um, juicy and delicious that it doesn't need that much flavor to absorb to absorb stuff and, and to make it taste delicious. So those of you who are on the plant-based journey, Kate, that's why I love, that's why we brought Garrett on is because mushrooms are such a great uh, addition to a plant-based diet for, as a replacement for, for meat, because they have that texture and because they're so high in protein and because they're so, uh, you know, dense in nutrition. So for all of those reasons, and plus they're fun to get connected to nature. I will just say, sorry, I'll let you go. But, but while it's on my mind, one of the main reasons why I love um, learning about this stuff, um, whether you guys live in the city or not, is because when you go on a hike or you go on an, a, a walk, even if you're in Central Park, um, I'm sure there's foraging in Central Park. Like no matter where you are, um, when you get to understand the different plants that are in front of you, rather than just seeing a sea of green, but you get to see the oak trees, the maple trees, the different types of trees and recognize them by their leaves. And you get to notice the different types of mushrooms. Now you feel like you're hanging out with them and you're one with nature in such a deeper level. And like, you, you're not just like a foreigner in, in nature, you're part of it. So I really, really like, you know, I should have started with that, but I hope. You that this that. I mean, the, the Amanita muscaria thing is going to kind of tie right into that. Okay. Um, Thank you for saying that because I, I agree. I mean, the plants and the mushrooms and the trees are all connected. Um, and that's actually my entire point here um, with Amanita muscaria. So I'm sure you guys have seen the red and white mushroom. It's actually the mushroom emoji. It's also the Mario mushroom. It's also the inspiration for Alice in Wonderland. Um, that's Amanita muscaria. Here in the Adirondacks, uh, we have a yellow variant of Amanita muscaria. Um, it's virtually the same mushroom. It just, for, for, for us here, it's, it comes out yellow. Um, and then where you guys are, it may be red. You may also have the yellow variant. I'm not exactly sure. Um, depending on where you are, it's a little bit different. But it's a very characteristic mushroom, and it's iconic. Um, so let's talk about... Amanita muscaria. There are two compounds in Amanita muscaria. One of them is ibotenic. Well, there's more, but <laughs> two worth talking about. Ibotenic acid. ibotenic acid is a toxin. It's actually a neurotoxin that causes brain lesions. So you would not want to eat Amanita muscaria. But there's another compound called muscimol. And a muscimol is a, a potent selective GABA agonist. It's actually a desirable psychedelic to some. Now, Here's the thing, ibotenic acid actually turns into muscimol uh, through a very simple process called decarboxylation. Now, with a little bit of heat, uh, by putting something in a warm acidic solution like lemon juice or lime juice or grape juice, basically ibotenic acid will turn into muscimol. Um, so there have been all sorts of these crazy historical um, celebrations and ceremonies that all of our ancestors would do to Amanita muscaria in order to solicit these properties and turn the ibotenic into uh, ibotenic acid into muscimol. And this is just kind of funny because one of the properties um, of muscimol apparently is that you feel immune to exhaustion and you feel light on your feet and you just feel powerful and limitless. And that's actually exactly what happens when you hit Amanita muscaria mushroom in Mario. And if you look at the little brown mushrooms here, that if I don't know if any of you have played Mario, but if you run into one of these little brown mushrooms, you die in the game. And so so this is like a, a little bit of a cultural cue that alludes to this. 
um, there were actually there was this thing called the war dance that Vikings and, and warriors would do in Europe um, to basically they would scream and agitate their body in such a way that they could get their body to decarboxylate the ibogenic acid into muscimol um, through their stomach acid. Uh, so, uh, and, and, you know, by raising their core body temperature. So and they would do this before war. And it was literally like the mark of a true warrior to eat these mushrooms. And obviously if you failed to do the war dance correctly, you would have a very negative experience. Um, and then the other thing is that people would even drink the the rain the urine of reindeer. As crazy as this sounds, um, shamans in Siberia would drink the urine of the reindeer who ate these mushrooms because their digestive system would have decarboxylated it and amplified the potency of the muscimol in the urine of reindeer. And why am I saying all of this? I just want you to see that Christmas colors of red and white have been inspired by Amanita muscaria mushrooms and visions of flying reindeer. Um, that is what these shamans would think about, I guess, after they did this, because the colors of Amanita muscaria are red and white. And then there's even deeper um, theories online about uh, Amanita muscaria potentially being the Eucharist. And, you know, I, I don't mean to offend anyone. Uh, I, I certainly believe Jesus was a historical person who walked the earth and, um, and was maybe all knowing of the natural resources of this world. And if anything, I would like to believe that um, that maybe that's possible. Um, so that is a mushroom that also is a mycorrhiza. And this is the one really cool thing about this mushroom that to me makes it feel a little bit godly and why that theory almost seems like a little bit credible to me. Um, this is one of the only mushrooms that nobody has figured out how to cultivate. It's a mycorrhiza, which means it forms a symbiotic relationship with the uh, root system of a tree. And uh, to take that a step further, like with Amanita muscaria, people can successfully cultivate Amanita muscaria mycelium or that thread-like uh, white cobwebby substance that makes up the most of a fungus, but it's only at the union of two mycorrhizae, plural, which again means one my mycorrhiza is the root system of a tree in a relationship with a fungus. It's only at the, the union of two mycorrhizal networks of one mushroom and one tree with another mushroom and an, or another fungus and another tree. When these oh. borders reach each other and they become one in nature is the only place that you will find Amanita muscaria mushrooms. Nobody has been able to successfully cultivate and fruit these mushrooms indoors or in any sort of lab setting. So it, it to me is just a magical mushroom that is uh, really the epitome of the power of nature. Uh, but I will say, don't get any ideas <laughs> from the information I've shared because the genus Amanita also includes the death cap and the destroying angel, uh, both of which will kill you uh, within an hour, even if you only eat a fingernails size piece of the mushroom. So that's uh, what I'm, I'm talking about, about the big joke. That to yeah. me is a big joke. <laughs> like, that on one hand it can be it can be this, and on the other hand, so similarly, it can be the, totally the opposite. <laughs> I get it now um, because <laughs> the mushrooms are like kind of tantalizing you a little bit. You know, yeah. they, want, they want you to eat them. Uh, they can cure you or they can kill you. Yeah, I think it's a reminder to keep a close relationship and and knowledge of of Mother Nature, right? <laughs> And, and it is a lesson. It is a lesson that like food is powerful in our, in our diets and in our lives and in our body and nature and plants that are in nature are so powerful. I feel like we have kind of taken the power away or at least Western medicine and society thus far has kind of taken the power away from nature and, and like, oh, well, that's just, you know, a plant. Like it's, it's not going to be as powerful as like amoxicillin, you know, mm -hmm. like, obviously it's not the same as a medicine. It's it, like, it's not the same as medication, but actually plants are really powerful. Penicillin is a, 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 the genus penicillium. It was, it's a mold, you know, that's, what's funny. Um, there we go. <laughs> mold, by the way, is just an unidentified fungus. Mold is just a fungus that has not produced a mushroom yet. So nobody really knows what it is. There's actually not like a clear category that defines mold, at least not one that I've been able to find. So that's something that to think about too, is like, and black mold 
I'm quite certain I've done a lot of research into this. Black mold is sort of like a myth. Like you're not going to, there may be a fungus growing in your basement, but it's, it's not going to kill you. <laughs> it's more the conditions that form black mold that actually could potentially become toxic to a person in the first place. So I also, I want to say um, a couple other things that I've learned over the years, which, you know, you never know where you get information, but um, one thing was um, that there's algae and then there's fungus and our genetic makeup is more like mushrooms than it is of like, you know, when, when we, as we were evolving, our genetic makeup is more like fungus and mushrooms than it is like other plants or, or like, uh, the, the direction of growth in that way. And I don't know why, but that just like speaks to me because I do feel like there's a true intelligence in fungus, um, that then manifests in like growing to be, you know, larger animals and intelligence as it evolved. So I feel like there's a real intelligence in, in fungus that's kind of like fundamental to it. And that also goes to show as to why it's such an amazing plant for the brain and for the body and for healing in that way. So um, while we have Garrett, any questions, put them in the comments. Also, everybody unmute themselves and say thank you to Garrett. This was like beyond amazing. Can I, yeah, go can ahead. I just say something quick? Um, Garrett has been kind enough to offer the Perfect Foods family 25% um, off if they place an order on the website. So I'm sharing that right now in the chat. There's a coupon code and a link to the website. Um, and I know we don't have a lot of time left, but um, I also wondered if you could just like briefly talk about like the tinctures that you guys make. So not just like eating mushrooms or brewing the chaga, but like the tinctures and, and how those are used or what they can be used for. Yeah. So the tinctures are basically a liquid extract um, of hot water and alcohol. So it's kind of like a full spectrum of the compounds that are healing in the mushroom. You get the water soluble parts and the alcohol soluble parts. So, and it makes it very easy to use it in your diet. Um, so it basically comes in a four ounce bottle. It will have a dropper, you know, this is a lion's mane tincture. Um, and you can just add four, four droppers full into a beverage or directly under the tongue if, uh, if you don't mind the flavor. And I also want to acknowledge, um, I really think it's really cool what you're doing because you're not just growing it from on a, on a, you know, on a tree yourself, but by getting spores and doing it, um, not necessarily perfectly naturally, you're actually doing it by foraging it in nature on the trees that they typically have them on. I just think it's so cool the way that you have this and it's not easy for you to spend all your days foraging. Um, do, do you find that like this period of time of the year is like it, like, is this the it time or is there other times for, of the year that you can forage? Yeah. For every mushroom has its own season. And actually it's so different. Like reishi mushroom only fruits every other summer as crazy as that is. And it's in sync all throughout the United States. It's like the mycelium has to reach some sort of critical mass because it only is really growing when the temperature is above freezing. So during the winter in the northern forests where it really grows, it kind of just goes dormant. And it takes about two years worth of growth to reach that point where it can explode with mushrooms. Um, so that's reishi every other summer. And so far it's been even years. And that may change, but that's been like for the 10 years I've been aware of reishi, um, that stayed consistent. Chaga, we actually pick in the winter because once the leaves fall off the trees, you can see way further into the, the woods and you can actually find it. Um, and there's a lot of stewardship involved in the chaga. Like it's not as simple as just harvesting as many as mushrooms as we find, you know, and ultimately we're trying to find a land partner that we can form a lease with that they'll actually surrender the rights to the birch trees so that we can like plant more birch trees and inoculate living birch trees with chaga and actually make it totally regenerative. Um, there's a lot of challenges involved in that because with logging being the main, the main <laughs> form of uh, economic <laughs> Um, that's, that's a big limiting factor because like people aren't going to be willing to surrender the rights to the trees and it takes 10 years for chaga to grow. So, uh, but most mushrooms like turkey tail and then all the mushrooms we just talked about in the slideshow, I would say now is prime time. And I want to make a mushroom calendar one day that actually has when each mushroom will be growing. I think that would be super cool.
Yeah, great idea. One thing I, another thing I thought of too, Garrett, um, that I equate kind of with perfect foods and the, we've talked before about um, making uh, juice from wheatgrass itself as opposed to wheatgrass powder. And I know you had mentioned too, that there's a big difference from the chaga that you harvest and produce than what some people sell in a powdered form. And I think that's really important for people to know too, that there's a great difference in the quality of um, chaga that can be found on the market. Thank you. I thank you for bringing that up because it's so important, but um, I see Justine also just, someone just left a comment about uh, 60 acres for sale in New York. And I, I'll return to that in a sec, but to answer your question, um, like, so basically a mushroom extract powder, uh, which is a dissolvable thing that you're going to put in water um, as like a coffee substitute or something like that. Um, it should be pitch black in color. doesn't matter whether it's lion's mane, whether it's chaga, whether it's reishi. Recognize that like a true authentic mushroom extract powder, the color comes out to be super dark. It's super potent. And so you find a lot of brands like Mudwater or Four Sigmatic or... Um, there's this new company called Rise. There's even a company called Real Mushrooms. And as ironic as it is to say, like they, they sell products that um, are sourced internationally where they can circumvent FDA authority. And basically, I think what happens is you have companies that are maliciously intentions uh, and they actually manipulate American brands and companies who are ignorant because we haven't grown up on the land here, you know. Um, America is a pretty new country. We don't have the rich cultural history of using mushrooms like uh, other other countries would. And I think that they manipulate even the owners sometimes of these companies. The people who form these companies may not even be aware that the products they're selling sometimes are fake, you know, or cut extremely, extremely cut with filler material, or maybe a chaga that's grown in a lab that literally just doesn't share any of the basic fundamental properties of chaga. Um, and you'll see it for yourself if you shop around like there's some products that are obviously gimmicks um, and some that are really potent and much more quality, better quality. Uh, uh, but ironically, the comment that was left about the land, I'm looking for between 50 to 100 acres uh, because there's a, a tax incentive that if it meets that that amount of land, um, there's a, a certain tax abatement program that um, you can qualify under. So maybe I'll just shoot my email in the chat here. I would love to connect with you about that. Amazing. You never know. Um, I want to say on the powders too, just to be like full circle on this, um, that like Heidi to Heidi's point about our perfect foods, this whole concept, like our tagline is fresh as best, right? Like that's our thing since the beginning of time, you know, about wheatgrass, about microgreens. Forever wild. <laughs> Forever Wild. Yeah, I love it. Um, and I was just saying to to someone recently, oh, one way to think about it that's easy is imagine when you're cooking and you're like, oh, shoot, I don't have onions. Let me use onion powder. Or shoot, I don't have garlic. Let me use garlic powder. Like, what's the difference? It's night and day. It's not, you can't compare it. So it's, if you can tell with, with onion and garlic, imagine with these incredible superfoods, what the difference is between fresh versus wheatgrass. When you have a shot of wheatgrass, it's like you have wheatgrass powder. It's, it's nothing like it's nothing. You have a shot of wheatgrass and you're off the charts. So that's the difference between fresh and not fresh. There, there's no explanation for it. Enzymes, fresh, living foods, nature. There's no way to explain it. You can't bottle it, period. So, um, this was incredible. Thank you, Gary. Um, those of you who are from the Perfect Foods community, keep your eyes out on September 28th. I'm leading a uh, masterclass, Wheatgrass and Microgreens 101, that's how to use it um, and where to get it. So those of you who are coming from Perfect Foods and just want to like a revamp that we do, um, please come to that. Keep your eye out. If you, if you registered for this class, um, you'll already be on my email list. So I'll be sending that out. That's on September 28th. Um, other than that, any, is there anything else you'd like to add Garrett before we say goodbye? Just thanks for the opportunity. And if you guys have any questions later, or if you want to send me a random mushroom picture and see if I can identify it or help in any way, yeah. um, feel free to email me. Uh, you can also subscribe to my email list if you want more mushroom information. Um, 
you can do that at birchboys.com. But uh, my email is Garrett at birchboys.com. And Garrett, can you join my Facebook group? Absolutely. Um, okay, yeah. So join my Facebook group. Everybody in here, people already are, but I want to start see you guys seeing you guys post mushroom pictures and like let's get mushroom. Like, do I search on Facebook to find it? it it's it uh, Perfect Foods Health and Wellness Fam. Um, that's the Facebook group, and it's any but any of you who are not in it, join it now. That's where the magic is happening. Of course, I have like a, a paid program. Um, I do these classes regularly for free when I have like a guest speaker that I'm really excited about. But I do have every single Wednesday a private group coaching class for people who are in our private community that are paid customers and can um, subscribe to be part of our Wednesday night classes and part of our programs and stuff. So that's the story. We do this as a service to all of you to share information because we think it's super important. And um, that's it. Everybody have a great night. Thank you for spending. Yeah, thank you so much, Garrett, for all the information. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Awesome. Can you just tell me Thank about you. the lion's mane? Do you eat that raw or, or does it need to be cooked? I, I've eaten it raw, but most people would probably say it needs to be cooked. I mean, there are other things that's like bugs that you'll find in the mushrooms. Um, you're not going to kill any of the benefits by cooking it. Um, so most people cook it, they saute it or they, they cook it kind of with like butter or they chop it in slices and saute it in oil but you don't need thank much <laughs> thank you You're welcome. i wasn't sure if you had to cook it or not because i know most mushrooms you do it tastes but a lot better sure hang on is that true that most mushrooms you do have to cook i would say that the t for, for flavor as well as like you know it comes from nature you know so even our mushrooms that we're harvesting we do, we have a heat kill step they're dried in a chamber at 140 degrees Fahrenheit, you do want to kill the bacteria. Um, I would say it's probably not entirely necessary, but you could get you could get sick or some gastro gastrointestinal upset um, if you don't. It's like if you have like a portobello mushroom or like a or like a bell button button mushroom or something, you can like a button mushroom and you put it into your you know salad raw. It's okay. It's not yeah. Gonna be a it's okay. It's fine. I mean, it, but it is better to, it's more digestible to, um, to have it. I mean, that's what I've noticed too, but it is, it is a good question though. I was Image. told that, um, heating mushrooms also brings out the benefits of it. Well, um, certainly like it can, when, when you're talking about extracting the heat is required to get it out of the mushrooms. And that, that's probably true for if you're using oil, you know, you're going to certainly extract certain things that otherwise might actually remain in the chitinous cell walls. And I got a cut on my face. I didn't realize um, the chitin, the cell walls of mushrooms are made out of chitin instead of cellulose like plants are. So that is a lot harder. So to get things to come out of the cell walls and be absorbed and bioavailable, that's definitely true. You need heat and some sort of medium to pull it out. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you the, for confirming. The mushroom, we can't get enough of it. <laughs> We're going to have to have you on again, Garrett. I don't care what you Okay. <laughs> okay thank you, Garrett. You yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, oh, my am friend. I the host? Am I, is, am I the reason this is still going? Okay. Hey, goodbye. All right, good night, everyone. All right, Bye. take care. Bye.